Hello, welcome to PM Express Personality Friday. On March 27th, the state's embassy in Accra for the sixth time running awarded a Ghanaian with the Martin Luther King Jr. Award for Peace and Social Justice. The award, according to the embassy, uh, recognizes Ghanaians who personify the philosophy and actions of Dr. Martin Luther King to strengthen communities by helping to build a culture of tolerance, dialogue, and conflict resolution. The award also honors activists who have promoted social justice, stability, human rights, and peace through nonviolent means. The 2013 award was given to our own Madame Afi Yakub. And um, she's my guest on the show tonight. It's great to have you, madam. Uh, I don't know how to refer to you, whether I should call you the honorary Martin Luther King Award winner, but it's, it's a great privilege to know you. How do you feel after all the celebration and fun that came with the award? I'm still trying to come to terms with it, you know, because I least expected that. Um, I was just doing the work that I thought I should do to contribute to social coexistence, community coexistence, peace in, in our community and our country at large. Uh, this is a commitment that I started long ago you know, because growing up in northern Ghana in the mid-60s and early 70s, I was actually confronted with the realities of abject poverty. You know, where sometimes when you are going to school, you see children of your own age who should be in school, but are rather on the farms, trying to glean from farms that had been harvested. So they would be uh, scratching the surface of the earth to pick groundnuts and things like that. And also, uh, when I went to the secondary school in Navrongo, I still had this uh, abject poverty following me because even in our dining hall, whenever we went for meals, there would be children hanging on the windows, you know, trying to just wait, waiting for us to finish eating and then they would come for the rest. And for me, that was something I felt needed to be addressed and even if it was just a very small intervention. So I would say that the, um, the, the geographical location in which I found myself growing up prepared me to work towards you know, sharing, extending love, and also ensuring that um, there is, there is peace. Because no matter how hard you work, if there is no peace, you cannot fight poverty. As someone once said, the biggest enemy to fight is poverty, not your neighbor or a perceived foe. Our biggest foe is poverty. So at which stage of your life, I mean, from the time you went to, you went to Navajo Technology? Yeah. So from that time through to when you I would say that right after school, you know, I, I felt I needed to go back and do community service because when I finished the National Film and Television Institute, oh, NAFTA, so you went to I went to NAFTA. I knew it is the first time I've ever had this. I'm a filmmaker. I studied script easy. writing and film directing. I so I opted to go back and do my service in the North. Unfortunately, uh, the National Service Secretariat wanted me to stay in Accra and work in all the regions where National Service uh, personnel were placed. In those days, we used to do two-year national service. So after the first year, I just felt I needed to go back up north because for me, it was a question that 
needed answering. Because those days, a lot of people didn't want to go up north. I think it's the same situation even today. They didn't want to go up north. And I wanted to go up north. And yet, they didn't want me to go up north. What was north. driving you there? Is it the same desire to help people get out of poverty? What was driving me there, you know, uh, graduating as a script writer and film director and reflecting on my own background and experience, I felt there was a lot you could do. I could do, there was a lot I could write about. And there were lots of stories that still needed to be told, and nobody was hearing that. For instance, when we were doing our uh, diploma um, production, I chose a rather difficult project. I wanted to do a documentary film up north. And those days, you even needed um, a concession ticket to travel to the north on STC. And so how could I have gone with... Uh, with a whole crew, and we didn't have the luxury of video cameras. Yeah, the modern luxury. Yeah. <laughs> we Which were shooting so on celluloid. Yes, we were shooting on celluloid, and it wasn't easy because it was quite risky. There were other students who needed the same equipment to go out and do their productions, and I wanted to carry a whole a crew and a backup a set of equipment up north. And so that was a big challenge, but I really wanted to do that. So eventually, I think that was when my organizational skills were tested. Um, our lecturers then said, well, if you will be able to organize and assure us that you will take the equipment out north and bring them back safely, then we cannot deny you, but you have to bear the cost of tra going with your colleagues and all that. So I, you did. Oh, I did. I went home and told my mom, who was a very good organizer. By the time we got the food staff, people to help us cook and feed us for all the number of days that we were going to uh, go up north to Bolgatanga and to work on the uh, Golgu Festival in Tongu. We were going up to, to capture what, what the filmmakers normally call serendipitous shots. You know, it's, you get it at the spell of the moment, or you don't have anything at all, so it because it was a very festival. Story, story you were chasing. I mean, no, was there was the, it was a docudrama, okay. so there was a story I was chasing, and I wanted to weave that festival, the Tongo festival, the much talked about Tongo festival, I wanted to weave it into the, the story, and this was something that you really couldn't control, mm -hmm. and uh, so we had to go out there and do that. And that was my first satisfaction that you know, I've been able to really push and to get what I want. And uh, for me, it was an encouragement that no matter how difficult the journey is, if you are determined and you persevere, you will make it. Mm -hmm. And I was surprised when on the day of our graduation, I was called to come forward for the Goethe Institute Award for Best Documentary. You were <laughs> I was surprised. So that's where it all started from. Let's fast track a bit to 1994 when uh, you worked as a researcher, conflict prevention campaign on women's equality. I mean, these, these are a lot of things put together. Talk us through those periods of 1994 and what you did then. Yes, remember around that period between 1993, 94, 95, 96, we had the inter, a multi ethnic conflict in northern Ghana, you know, where almost every other ethnic group was fighting the other, and it was really shocking. You know, that was my first confrontation with conflict. And before then, as a filmmaker, you know, I used to do freelancing for organizations in the north, so I had. Um, a project going with Norin where I had to do a documentary for them. And uh, what really shook me was, you know, when I visited a community known as Lavanja, uh, between uh, Yendi and Bimbila, and spoke to the chief, who was so passionate about getting 
water, getting support for everybody in his community, irrespective of whether they were Nanumbes, Dagumbes, Kokumbes. And a day after we left, it was one of the first communities that was attacked and the chief was killed. I, I still have his picture in my album because I had promised him that I was going to get the picture and light and framed and, and then bring it to him. And he was never able to. And um, we left the Lanja community a day after the conflict reached Lanja. And I was in Tamale, I had gone back to Tamale. So from my office floor, it was a three-story building. I could see uh, Inter Royal Hotel on fire, and some Pito houses wow. were also on fire. So you were actually riding that action. Yeah, I saw that, and then um, people were you not scared for no, your own life? No, that it. was in, in Tamale. That was in Tamale. So you could just watch from a distance, but helplessly. There was nothing you could do about it. And so for me, the, the message was very clear that conflict is like a twinkle of an eye. You can have peace today and tomorrow you can have some gone. So it's a very tight rope we have to walk and we really have to, to manage our peace. And uh, in the absence of just proper civilized dialogue, any group of people can go into conflict. That was the, the message for me. And so the challenge again for me was, all right, you are sitting here watching people's investments going up in flames. What are you going to do as a filmmaker? Yes, I know how to capture all those images, but how do I use my communication skills to get these people to dialogue? And I'd been working on the Tolo irrigation project for almost six years, mobilizing communities, producing uh, video, video films on extension technology and so on and so forth. So I knew how to mobilize people, but how do you get people to communicate their differences in a way that will not draw blood? So I went back to school. What did you go and study then? So from 1994, these things drove you back into the classroom to learn. Yeah, I went to the University of Southampton to do my master's. And uh, it what was... What did you study then? I studied television for development. Okay. Serious <laughs> business. You were determined to use the skill you have yes. to make the difference. Yes. So I studied television for development. And then um, when I graduated, I had a choice to make, to come home and pick up the work I'd left behind. But before I could do that, I really needed to test my newly acquired skills. skills. So I, I brought all my colleagues to the Gumwam Kudumbura refugee camp. Come. That was Which year was this? I mean, theater. because if you talk about Bujum uh -huh. Kam, that was in the late 2000s? Or no, 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 like before then. Before then, mm -hmm. okay. That was, that was 96, 97, 97, 98. Okay. We were at the camp. And uh, for me, it was a live theater. But then you were done with your, your at, studies. At, at graduated. It was a live theater. In fact, the Gumwa Budumburam experience was part of the training. You know, We either had to go to Sudan, South Sudan or come to Ghana and uh, we had a number of proposals I think my proposal was the most exciting so we all decided to to come to Ghana and to stay at the Gomwa Budumburam refugee camp and I say it was a live theater because um, that's where you would see people who have been very influential reduced to just subsistence you wake up in the morning um, and you just hang around. You know, there, is, there is basically nothing to do. Um, you either organize children and say you are teaching them or people are blaming each other for their situation. So there was constant you know, uh, conflict. And so after that, everybody went back. We did our 
um, we, we graduated all right and went, about, went our separate ways. I came back and um, worked for about a year. And within that year, what were you within, doing? Within that year, I finished documentaries that were still hanging. You know, this time, you know, I did things on um, empowerment. Disabled people trying to pick up the pieces, you know, um, abused women. You, uh, the, the, the you didn't, didn't do anything about abused uh, women. No, I, I didn't do, at the time, I didn't do anything on that. What I did was uh, looking at the visually impaired farming, you know, something like that. And um, also organizing young groups to, and I was teaching them um, filmmaking, acting. I see. So, what makes good storytelling. And um, to date, I think we still have some of the groups that have metamorphosed into big video, private yes. video production companies. It makes you companies. feel good. It makes, feel good. Good. Uh, it makes me feel good. So that was what I was doing. I did that for about three years and joined my husband in South Africa. And uh, in South Africa, I was even much more convinced to come home and work. You know, because um, apartheid had been brought down on its knees and um, former combatants had gone back. And then the, the whole theater of, well, we've, we've fought, we've won, so what next? Came back again and um, not, people not knowing exactly how to start life again. You know, so there was all this confusion, fighting in the uh, various uh, townships and so on. So I must say that I learned a lot you know, just in, in South Africa and working with other video companies like the uh, audiovisual alternatives. And so when I came back, uh, that was when uh, democracy was beginning, was beginning to take root in West Africa. There were issues of um, post-election dilemmas. Uh, you look at Liberia, um, where they were not sure whether to have elections before resolving the conflict permanently or the other way around. And so even when Charles Taylor came back, there was still so much tension in the, in, in the country. And you look at Sierra Leone, which thought that, look, we would have election and then we will resolve the conflict. They did not come out of the woods with that. And then suddenly, um, Cote d'Ivoire also caught fire. Mm. And we were just marching into our 2000 historic election. Yes. And you, can, you remember all those, you know, threats of conflicts in, in Ghana, you know, if there isn't proper trans transition, the, the country will burn, and there were lots of threats, and every, almost everybody was quite worried. What I realized then was that <clears throat> a lot of people were quiet, even though they were complaining you know, that the threats were not very, very civil, and so I thought we, we could do something. We could just get the political parties to assure us that whoever won the election, you know, would fairly, you know, would be given the chance. That was our agenda. And um, as soon as we made the move, we realized that a lot of people had been waiting for such an, such an opportunity. They started talking and um, the, the response to our invitation for people to come and discuss post-election dilemmas, learn from other countries, and to prepare ourselves for our post-election. You know, so uh, the response was quite positive, and that was the beginning of FOSDA. Of FOSDA. Yeah, the Foundation for Security and Development in Africa. So we thought that, well, we, 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 sh we should formalize this uh, initiative. And when we did, 
we started asking ourselves about what so, is it? Um, so does it mean that before FOSDA, you really had not set up any um, perhaps organization? Because in 1994, when you were working in the conflict areas, mm -hmm. you formed uh, women groups, but you didn't really have an institution like FOSDA until 2000, when FOSDA came along. It, it wasn't as organized as we okay. did in the case of FOSDA, but we had uh, women... Um, um, women, women, Northern Ghanaian women against conflict. Okay, and uh, at the time, what we wanted to do was to say to the men that look, if you are fighting, we are not fighting, and so we would mobilize. You know, um, like used clothes and medication and give it to people uh, the internally displaced so that was what we were doing and uh, the media wasn't as vibrant as, it, as is it is now and so we were unable to do all the media hype that one would have done if it were today you know, like hitting the uh, the airwaves and yeah. all that we didn't have that so or even mobile phones were not available yeah. so it was mainly on long uh, landline phone calls or even traveling to the locations that you needed to intervene i'm sure the martin luther king award perhaps for you might uh, be very significant in the types of awards you have you have won i mean walk us through some of the recognition you have received in your career from the time you you started the uh, organization and, and, and things like that. What are some of the achievements we have been recognized for? The centenary film making in Ghana. Um, I was surprised when I was asked to come forward for an award because of my role in organizing what we call women behind the camera. You know, that was the African women in film and video. So that was one significant award for me and an assurance that no matter how small your contribution is, there are people who, yeah, who notice it. And then in 2004, um, a group, I think Northern Diasporans, Northern Ghanaians in the diaspora. Um, all of a sudden, they called me and said, "Oh, you you have been uh, nominated to receive the Dabong Personality of the Year Award." And so I quickly went to check. You know who has received this before me? And Diana had received it before, and Dr. David uh, Abdullah had also received it. I think I was the third to have received it, so I was quite excited. And then uh, there was the Edbeck Foundation uh, in 2006, Ralph Edbeck, is a Swedish environmentalist. And I was given the award in Sweden on my role in promoting environmental peace and conflict resolution. There was also the UN uh, Millennium Development Stand Up and Speak Against Poverty Recognition uh, Award. And, but the m most exciting and most recent you know, is the Martin Luther King Award because Martin Luther King is an individual who touched almost the entire world with his philosophy of uh, non tolerance, nonviolence, approaches. and ap approaches. And for me, uh, that was something I, I thought, you know, really humbled me, you know, to have been recognized for the work that uh, I do. You know, something that I think it's a duty, more or less, you know, because once you come from such an experience, you know, I think it's a responsibility to make a contribution to change the lives of others. Well, you're watching uh, PM Express Personality Friday, and I'm having a chat with Miss Afi Azeratu Yakubu, who is a 2013 recipient of the U.S. Embassy's Martin Luther King Awards uh, for 
peace and social justice. We'll take a short break and when we return, we'll delve into the person herself and how she has been rising up to this point where she has been honored with this award. Stay with us. Welcome back to PM Express Personality Friday. My guest is Miss Afi Azaratu Yakubo. So, Madam, in 2004, when you were uh, giving the recognition as the Dabon uh, Personality of, of the Year, how did that make you feel, considering the numerous other people who have won it before you? Well, <laughs> every recognition of this magnitude, you know, makes you feel so encouraged and it emboldens you to want to do more, you know, because it assures you that you are doing something that um, is appreciated. And so to have received it after uh, people like the Yana and uh, Dr. David Abdullah, I felt, you know, I, I needed to do more, you know, and I also felt that it was an encouragement. And basically what I was what I did in terms of um, uh, the Dagbon conflict, which may have drawn the attention of those who uh, the selection committee was the fact that, you know, I, I decided that, look, let's not just keep conflict management to the top. Let's go down to the grassroots, okay? And so that's what I was doing, working with you know, the, the foot soldiers, if you can put it, put it that way, and women's groups and so on, to also encourage them to speak up. Were you not afraid whilst you were at it? Because, I mean, Yana himself lost his life to this cause, really, anyway. So, whilst at it, did you not stop to think that you could be in danger of your life as well, and perhaps that of your family? No, that, that was when every well-meaning Ghanaian had to do something, because... To think of uh, somebody, you know, of that caliber losing his life to um, a situation that could have been resolved, you know, actually you know, was just an issue that needed to we needed to pick up and to work more on it. I I don't think that um, my life was in danger in any way. I just had the feeling that you know I was ad I was raising the voice of a whole lot of people who were disapproving of the situation and yet not talking about it. So all I was doing was to to encourage people to speak up and to uh, demonstrate the fact that you know this, this was a despicable act. Nobody should condone a, such a violation of human rights. And how did you manage to stay neutral? I mean, neutral in the sense that when, when you're in such a situation, you might, you, you could stand the possibility of being uh, uh, biased to one side or the other in, in your association. How did you manage to keep focused and neutral? Just to keep reminding yourself and to, to look at um, the interest at stake to be much bigger than the individual group interests you know so um, for me being objective was just what needed to be done and if uh, you are working in a situation like that you realize that there are a whole lot of people who are getting fatigued you know and need to be encouraged to to look beyond you know the individual specific interests and so that's that's how I work up to date you know I try as much as possible to be, to be very objective, even though uh, you may be pigeonholed in a way that you may not like it, but eventually they'll realize that look, you, you're just working for the sake of humanity. You want um, uh, the larger community to enjoy peace instead of just one sector to enjoy peace. If you look back at um, what you've done and you, you reflect to the situation now, how do you feel about the current situation up in the conflict areas of Ghana? There is still a lot to be done. There is still a lot to be done uh, because a lot of the issues have not been addressed. And, um, we, but that doesn't mean that we should give up. Okay. 
Um, that is why we have to identify with the old adage that it's much more expensive to work for peace than to work for conflict. Okay, and so and so um, we still have to continue to work because the issues, whether it's in Boku or in in Yendi or Bunkurbu, have not been addressed. But to address those issues, there is one fundamental thing we keep ignoring. Um, struggle over limited resources, struggle over land, poverty that continues to suck people into a vacuum of, uh, you know, a vacuum. And for as long as we live in that size of poverty, we will continue to have conflict because children will not go to school. Children will not have the opportunities. Um, people, men and women, will struggle for limited resources. So how can, and this, all how, can this, how can this really be resolved? I mean, we live in a society of this nature, a society where resources are scarce, and every now and then we need to prioritize things. So, and then our family structures and, you know, our social structure itself makes it such a way that we're divided already. We have laws, but do we, have the, we, do we have, respect the laws? Um, do, do we have institutions that enforce the laws? And are we well educated to understand the repercussions of violating some of these standard regulations? Not until we are sensitized to the level where we appreciate where to draw the line between right and wrong and to understand the repercussions of going beyond our rights, we would continue to, to have uncontrollable situations like we have, not only in the north, but throughout our country. You know, I think we have the laws, we have the regulations, but we have to strengthen the organizations and institutions that have been put in place to enforce those regulations. Unfortunately, we don't have that yet. When you look at the work you've done and the fact that once you work so hard to ensure that um, conflicts are resolved and people have a platform to talk about their concerns, there is also the other issue of proliferation of small arms, which is creating uh, a new threat in terms of armed robbery and small arms going into wrong hands. It must be tough in this environment that you work in, considering all these challenges. Yeah, you get very unpopular in certain cycles, but once you, you realize that you are doing the right thing, you know, I don't think um, you have to fear. Uh, taking the proliferation of small arms, for instance, you know, I think our individual sub-regional governments recognized the threat of small arms in wrong hands way back in 1998 and instituted the uh, ECOWAS moratorium on the importation, exportation and manufacture of light weapons. But it was just a confidence-building mechanism to encourage uh, the individual states to regulate the flow of weapons and their use in the individual countries. But um, a moratorium can either be accepted or rejected. There is no legal, you know, prohibition. And so when we realized this, our campaign for five years was to ensure that the moratorium was replaced with a much more legally binding uh, convention. And that was that. We succeeded in doing that in 1996. But the question is, has it stopped the use of you know, weapons illegally? You know, from our own research, uh, embarrassingly, some of the weapons that are used in committing crimes even come from our state armories. 
you know so that's why i'm saying that our regulations have to be enforced okay and um we can constitute institute all these uh, regulations but if we don't have a mechanism to enforce them we would continue to have such problems um in in the 15 ECOWAS countries, for instance, um, almost all of them have indicated their willingness to ratify the ECOWAS Convention. Some have ratified, most of them have ratified. And so what stops us from making sure that we come out with stringent regulations, we organize public sensitization campaigns how can we ensure that we would recognize community security as a collective responsibility so that when a suspicious character is within our our environment we don't wait until he or she commits a crime before we report. But normally we even realize that our own relatives are not leading lives that you know cannot be questioned. They go out, they don't work, and they come back with lots of goodies and you just turn a blind eye. That is why I'm saying that um, no matter how many awards we receive, the challenge is for each and every one of us to realize that the peace we want to enjoy, the security we want to have, is a collective responsibility. And if we do not work together, no government, no government will, able, will be able to provide us with the needed security that will make us comfortable. We have to work with government. We have to work with government. Now, your journey from, from where you started to today, if I'm to ask you, what are some of the um, impacts you've had in various sectors which you, you cherish much? Would you name a few? Yeah. In, in 89, what happened in um, I went to Burkina Faso to attend uh, first Paco. And then I realized that there were lots of Ghanaian girls out there. Being, just struggling to live and being abused on a daily basis. And so I got very interested, but got very curious, and decided to do a much more detailed study. And realized that it was a sub-regional phenomenon of girls moving out, being trafficked. Kaya Ye wasn't, you know, the thing then. You know, they were rather heading for Cote d'Ivoire, Burkina Faso, Togo, and uh, Nigeria and beyond. And so I did. A docudrama called Bondage. Bondage. Okay. It was just talking about the plight of girls who either go out to look for employment but unaware of the dangers lurking out there in terms of. Uh, human trafficking in different forms, forced sex workers, you know, and threats like, you know, I'm smuggling you out and until I bring you back, you really cannot come back because you don't have documentation. And these are very, very vulnerable girls from even much more vulnerable communities where parents are desperate, you know, so they are willing to let their daughters go. And in 2010 or 2011, the same story that I told in bondage repeated itself in this country, you know, where almost 15 girls um, had been trafficked to uh, 
to Nigeria and with the combined force of uh, the Ghanaian and Niger Nigerian police anti-trafficking unit, they managed to retrieve the girls. Okay. And their stories were not different from the story of Mariam okay, the, that I told in uh, 89, 87, 89. And so for me, that raised a lot of questions about um, whether our government, whether our communities are ready to pick up hints and to mobilize, to reduce some of the threats that are actually self-inflicted. Okay, It's not very different from the children who are um, given away to fishermen to fish in the Volta Lake, the Volta River. And these stories still need to be told. We can't just afford to tell one story and stop. We have to continue. We have to keep hammering. Today, Abobloshi and Kaya Ye is almost you know, the order of the day. But the stories of those girls who come haven't changed. They get abused. They get uh, violated in so many ways. The little property that they normally put together gets so stolen from them. You know, and um, I really want to be able to, to, to ask those people to question the lawmakers when they come soliciting their, their votes. You know, to ask them, what can you do for us in, our, in this situation? Why is it that after almost 20 years of electing people and bringing them back to make our situation better? Our situation is still our not situation better. Our situation is not better. It's, it, do, it doesn't look like it's even improving in any way. You know? um, so we as individuals, I don't think we are doing much. We are not mobilized enough to hold our lawmakers accountable. You sound very passionate about what you do and um, holding lawmakers accountable is one of the problems uh, that we all face. Do you get partnership or support from lawmakers or from government to make sure to, to enable you to pursue some of the goals that your, your organization sets itself? My immediate response is yes. You know, I talked about the ECOWAS convention but for the support of the lawmakers, we wouldn't have had the ECOWAS convention. You know, we had a lot of support uh, from especially our national lawmakers. Remember, we also had to make sure that we lobbied other uh, uh, lawmakers in the other West ECOWAS countries. So at a certain level, you know, I must say that our lawmakers are very, very cooperative. They work closely with civil society. We've had a lot of support from them. Whenever we organize workshops and we invite them, they do come. Okay. But my issue is, you know, working on the ground. You know, that's, that's where I, I, I think I, I want to see them do more. You know, that, that is my, my problem with our lawmakers. They are not doing as much as I would have liked to see them do in, in their communities. Right, my name is Stephen Ante and you're watching a chat with Afi Azerato Yakubu, who is the 2013 Martin Luther King Awards, uh, Awards winner for Peace and Social Justice. We'll take a short break and when we return, we'll get to know the person herself, who Afi Yakubu is and what inspirations have brought him this month. Stay with us. Welcome back to PM Express. I'm having a chat with Ms. Afi Azerato Yakubo. So, Madam, we've been talking about 
your work. Let's talk about your personality. I mean, you, you started earlier by telling us that you went to Navrongo Secondary School. Before Navrongo Secondary School, how was life growing up? Very exciting. You know, very I, come, exciting. I come from a very large family um, of th seven boys wow. and, and three girls. And I'm the youngest girl. Wow. And I grew up in the midst of my brothers. Strong men. Strong men. So I learned to do the high jump, the <laughs> climb all the trees yeah. around. You know, uh, because we were always a lot of children in the house. If you didn't speak up, nobody had you. Yeah. <laughs> so I've grown up with that. Sometimes I have to raise my voice to be heard. <laughs> And has that and been negative or positive, as far as you know? I mean, in, no, in charting this career, yes. it's, it's been very positive because I'm not afraid to be independent, you know, because um, growing up, I, I had to, to fight along my brothers. You know, they were much stronger, bigger boys, but I had to, to insist on what I wanted. And so... It's been part of my growing up, but it was a very loving family, and um, my dad was working with PWD then, those days Public Works Department, and my mother, a very very hardworking, enterprising woman, you know, who was almost jack of all trades. <laughs> you know, she would sell Juggle everything. everything she would sell everything life. just to make sure that we we remained in school. And Talking about so, remaining in school, I mean, I would have thought that at the time you were growing up, uh, education, boys' education was preferred to girls. So the fact that you had formal education itself uh, is a plus to your parents. Tell me how, how that happened. Yeah, I, I think that I was just lucky to have been born by my parents, you know, because those days it wasn't, you know, very fashionable to, to have girls in school and uh, those that I started class one with, the girls that I started class one with, most of them eventually dropped out or they, they just continued to form four and, and it ended there. And you know, I think I was encouraged because my senior siblings were all going to school and I keep saying I was lucky because uh, my dad was he, he had the opportunity of going to school himself and so there was no reason why he shouldn't you know keep me in school and uh, because I had all my senior siblings around you know who who were very passionate about education you know I grew up knowing that when you come from school you have to do your homework. So which school were you in? Several schools. Several As schools. I mentioned my dad was working with the Public so Works Department, so lot. he moved around so he a lot. started from where? Uh, started briefly in Wa, you know, I don't so remember it Wa. very well. And then came to Tamale, went to Yendi, to Bolga. And, all over you know, that. All over. <laughs> yes. I see. So, I mean, the type of family you grew up in and the kind of upbringing you had, would you say it was a strict, strict family structure or... It was liberal. I mean, for you to, as a woman growing up then, to be given formal education perhaps makes me think your family was liberal enough. Most of the time we were not in Tamale, where uh, we originally come from. You know, and we, we were mainly not part of the socio-cultural you know, atmosphere that our parents would have loved to see us grow up in. But what they did was to make sure that, you know, we didn't lose out. You know, they they organized such events for us, even if it was on a very small scale. You know, I remember uh, growing up in Wa, it was the fire festival, you know, period. And so our dad organized our own little fire festival and tied touches for us to to go to a tree and try to throw it onto the tree. And it always... Um, he preceded that with you know, telling us about the festival, you know, how it came to be observed, you know, and so on and so forth. And then the Guinea Fowl Festival, you know, that one I really didn't like it because you know, those days they had to plug the feather, the feather, the guinea fowl, and then 
Um, so we were not happy with that, and that stopped. And also the, um, the Damba Festival, for instance. So we grew up knowing a lot, a lot, a lot about um, our culture. And whenever we, we did it, it was a moonlight night, for instance, we would have storytelling after, of course, our homework, after we had finished with our homework. And our mom was the, the chief storyteller. She would, uh, sometimes she would tell the stories, sing and sing and sing. And by the time you realize you wake up early in the morning in your bed, you wouldn't know how you would have gotten to your bed. So do you, so, do you remember some of your friends who were with you in Navrongo Secondary School, for example, and what they do now? Yeah. Um, my not my friends, but my schoolmates. Your schoolmates. I, I remember lots of them. Mm. Are they also? Are some of them also into uh, this field you work in, conflict resolution, empowerment? Do any of them work in that area? Uh, it doesn't come to mind immediately. You know, I don't remember. You know, but. They are not in the country. Uh, okay. Most of them are not in the country. And those that are in the country, you know, they they are also, okay. you know, in, in good positions. You know, those who are about What about your mates in NAFTA? Um, oh, yes. A lot more. I a bring lot. it forward, maybe <laughs> refresh your memory. So who are some of the people you were, you were in school with uh, in NAFTA? Uh, Frimpong. Yao Frimpong. I see. You know, and then... Uh, Sarah Kunto came and met us in Nafti, and then Jim Awindo, we had just left when they came in, and uh, Nanajwa Awindo also, we had just left when they came in, and uh, uh, Linus Abraham, I think the, the, the director of Nafti now, he was our mate, I see. No, he, he was actually my direct mate, and they've, they've grown into big, big filmmakers. So I do still make films. I mean, seeing that you are an expert mm -hmm. in filmmaking, making films for development, do you still make films? No, I would say not directly. You know, what I, I do, you know, is making that, producing my own films, you know, like uh, uh, film documentaries on Forza's work, you know, and things like that. But that's what I want to go back in, you know, after all the years of research and experience in the sub-region, I think I've gathered enough experience. experience, I've gathered enough material to go back, to go into, back into that documentary area. production. We really have to tell the stories of Africans, we have to tell the stories of Ghanaians and West Africans. For instance, when um, we were chasing our heads of state around the sub-region, uh, campaigning for the ECOWAS convention, almost every summit, no matter where it was, we made sure that we went there. And so we had to go to Niger. We checked our budget and all that and realized that, hey, there's no way we can fly all these people to Niger because you would have to make travel allowance of about three days or four days, you know, and so we decided that, look, we are going to drive. I see. When, when, <laughs> you, look at, when you look at the film industry, I, I want to tease your mind a bit about um, our film industry. A lot has gone on from the, uh, the days of um, I told you so mm -hmm. to, to modern filmmaking. Uh, what do you see? How, how do you describe the transition? You think it's a good one, or we can do better in film production? You know, I think I I go back in time with a lot of nostalgic feeling. You know about um, Ghana, the Ghana film industry, and the promise that it had, and suddenly the profession being hijacked. In, in a way that you know, makes it very, very difficult for you to tell who is a real professional filmmaker and who is not. And um, reflecting on some of the, the, the teachings of our senior 
filmmakers in those days, you know, and how to develop a storyline, the kind of stories that we need to tell as a developing country, and the responsibility of the filmmaker, you know, in capturing our culture, our beliefs, and in promoting development in a way, you know, that will address some of the problems, the lacking. developmental problems we are challenging in it our modern lacking. films. And, um, I hate to admit this, but sometimes I just turn off, turn off um, from watching, from any watching film. some of these movies because it's just special effects, no special do you think thought that perhaps um, too into... much commercialization without uh, state authority, as was the case in uh, Ghana films, could possibly be the reason behind this? Uh, it's one reason, but then we also have to realize the fact that uh, we, we are supposed to have a censorship board. Okay? So if you over censor, <laughs> if you over censor, you know, the other, other films will come in from elsewhere. Yeah. You know, so it looks as if we are now competing on, you know, who can make the best um, witch hunting film, you know, uh, superstitious films, spiritual films, you know, things like that. But there's a whole lot of themes that we could still do in a way that will make people want to sit and watch, but at the end of the day, they will learn a lesson. Traveling from Tamale to Accra, for instance, sometimes I just sit there and try to sleep. I can't sleep. You know, the, the TV is turned on full blast. The monitor is turned on full blast. And these are captive audience for 12 hours. And they are just showing us nonsense. Okay. So what do we do? What do we do? It's a real problem. It's, I mean, it's when a problem. You, as a professional filmmaker, see this. Is there a way forward? Yeah, we shouldn't give up. We shouldn't give up. Eventually, there will be a saturation of this nonsense, and people would want to see real films. You know, for instance, my uncle, Kwawansa, is still focused doing the films that you know, we all love to watch those that we have missed, you know, and yet it's always a box office hit. But you don't see the kind of things that we see on our screens. If we are able to get uh, people like Kwawansa handing over to the younger generation, and the younger generation accepting to be very professional, first and foremost, before being commercially oriented, then we would begin to pick up the pieces. But I'm tell us about marriage. I mean, uh, you spoke to us earlier about your husband being in South Africa and you have to go and see him. I mean, how has marriage life and being married to somebody who perhaps is not at home complements your work? You know, I, I must say that, you know, I, I always feel very blessed and lucky. To, to have a husband like my husband, Napoleon Abdullah, you know, because he's one that you can discuss anything with. You know, and he always has ideas. Okay, so um, I don't think I would have been receiving all these awards, you know, without his input, you know, because he's a deep thinker and quite dedicated to work. If you know you don't have time about a project, don't mention it to him. You know, otherwise he won't let you sleep. So he has been your mentor. You know, yeah, yes, right. yeah, he won't let you sleep. He will make sure that the job is done. So that is the kind of um, relationship I have with my my husband, and um, he he works with the UN in Liberia, and. <coughs> at the, the presentation at the American ambassador's residence. You know, he, was, he was there again to support me, and he's always been like that. You know. um, so he's always supported me. What about children? Okay. Uh, we have Sule, Sule Mandinso. You know, he is 
uh, in the UK now, okay. and he's um, he's uh, about 19 years now, okay. and he's um, studying mathematical study? science. Oh. Mathematical science. You are so, uh, Swiss, Swiss, <laughs> yeah. rocket scientist. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. So, um, what kind of relationship do you have with your child and your husband? Mm. Seeing that you both live. Your son, your son is in the UK, you are here, your husband works with the UN, which means that he could be in different countries at that particular time. How do you manage? No, we, we, we try and meet. Okay. okay. For instance, my husband has the uh, rest and recuperation period, you know, he always comes down. And after 18, in the UK, you are an adult. You know, so That's true. so uh, we just manage to program our lives in such a way that we are able to meet. And uh, I must say that Sule is my husband's son, you know, so his mother is in the UK, you know, as well. So he gets to meet her. So how are you? I'm 55. Wow, you really don't look mm. 55. And mm. in all your 55 years, what would you say is the one single thing you look up to and say you're content with? Um... Uh, content with the it's achievements really of right? yeah, it's quite it's quite difficult. Uh, I I think that there's still a lot to be done, uh, but I I'm happy about Forza. I'm happy about the the focus of our project and. I'm really happy about the fact that I'm working with all these young, passionate, you know, people, you know, who who want to carry on. You know, so I'm happy about that. So, how is this award going to spur you on into new heights from now on? Um, I don't know. You know, I'm just going to continue to work, okay? Now, our biggest uh, project is what we call Youth in Governance and Women's Economic and Political Empowerment. So uh, that's what we are going to focus on. That's what we've been doing. In 2012, for instance, we mobilized uh, youth to campaign for for non-violent elections. And we are working with over 50 schools across the sub-region um, on youth in governance and non-violent elections. So these are projects that we will continue to work on. Thanks, uh, Madam Afia Kubu, for making time for us on PM Express. My name is Stephen S.T. and thanks for uh, staying with us on PM Express personality Friday with the 2013 recipient of the U.S. Embassy's Martin Luther King Award for Peace and Social Justice. Good evening.